Hi, in today's micro lecture I'll be talking about how fusion happens inside stars. So what is the power source of stars like the Sun and a little bit about how it proceeds and how we know what the Sun is doing deep down in its insides since of course we can't go visit. Solar energy generation for a long time could have been imagined to be just a giant fire. If you think back, say, two, three thousand years ago, and you ask somebody, why is the sun shining? They could possibly have said, well, it's just on fire. So how do we know today that that's not true? There's a couple of reasons, one trivial and one less so. Uh, the trivial reason, of course, is that fires need air, and we now know that there's no air in space. The less trivial way that we could figure that out is to think about how much energy the sun is putting out every second, its luminosity, and then also think about what we know about the mass of the sun based on the orbits of all the planets. And if you assume that the sun is just a giant pile of wood with the appropriate mass and the appropriate luminosity, you figure out that the sun would have had to have burned out all of its fuel long, long ago, long before our current age, even assuming that human civilization only goes back about eight to 10,000 years. Over the course of the 19th and early 20th centuries, astronomers and physicists toyed with different ideas for how the sun could actually generate its energy, and we finally settled on what we call a nuclear process. There are two different ways that nuclear processes can be used to generate power or energy. The first, which we see in terrestrial power plants, is what's called nuclear fission in which a heavy nucleus like uranium or plutonium is split in half, and in so doing, it releases some energy. The other process that we see in the sun and also in the most powerful nuclear weapons is what we call nuclear fusion. So rather than splitting one heavy nucleus, two light nuclei get combined to make one heavier one. That's what happens in the sun. Now, before I can dig into how that happens, we need to take a brief aside and talk about some notation issues. Hopefully, most of you will have seen something like the notation on the left-hand side of the slide previously, where we have that small number out front followed by a chemical symbol. So four helium is telling me a couple of important things. It's telling me first that it belongs to the chemical element helium, Helium is the second element on the periodic table. It's got two protons in its nucleus. That's what it means to be helium. And then that number four out front is telling me the total contents of this nucleus. So it's helium, so it's got two protons. And then that number four is telling me that there are a total of four things in that nucleus, two protons and two other things. Over the course of our discussion about stellar fusion in the Sun, there are going to be a couple of different nuclei that are going to be important. The first is standard garden variety hydrogen. Common hydrogen has one proton in its nucleus and nothing else, so we call that one hydrogen. There are other isotopes of hydrogen out there, however. There's one that occurs in nature on the Earth, and that is two hydrogen, sometimes also called deuterium. This is found in particular in heavy water, which can be extracted from ocean water. In two hydrogen, we still have one proton, because that's what it means to be hydrogen, but we also have an extra neutron sticking around for a total of two. Helium for helium in particular, is going to be the end product of the fusion process in our sun. For helium has two protons that I referred to earlier, and it also has those two red neutrons. Okay, so having gone through a quick reminder of what atomic nuclei look like, let's go back and start looking at how fusion happens in the sun. Nuclear fusion, and indeed all nuclear processes, produce energy by relying on the famous physics equation from Albert Einstein, E equals mc squared. 
this equation tells us that we can turn or that energy equals mass times the speed of light c squared. What that means is that if we can figure out a mechanism to do it, we can exchange energy for mass or vice versa. In nuclear processes, what happens is that a small amount of mass gets destroyed through complex nuclear physics that I'm going to largely ignore, and that small destroyed mass turns into energy, and it's that energy that powers the sun or your nuclear power plant or your nuclear weapon. In the sun, as we'll see over the next few minutes, four hydrogen nuclei, so four one hydrogen nuclei, get combined to make four helium. In the process, a little bit of mass disappears. So if you add up all of the mass of those four one hydrogen nuclei, that total is just a little bit less than the mass of one four helium nucleus. That missing mass gets turned into energy. Different stars will take that same basic process, fusing hydrogen to make helium, and they'll do it using slightly different chains of events. In the sun, most of the fusion happens through something that we call the proton-proton chain. Over the next few minutes, I'll briefly summarize how this works, but don't worry too much about the details. There's one important bit in this process that I'm going to emphasize. It comes right at the beginning, and then there's the summary at the end. So there's one important detail and then the overall result of the process. The sun starts its fusion cycle by combining two hydrogen nuclei, so two times one hydrogen, and producing another hydrogen. So we take one proton, another proton, mush them together, and we get two hydrogen. So one of those protons, say this one, has to spontaneously turn into a neutron. So we get one proton and one neutron in the nucleus of this two hydrogen. That's allowed. It's very rare. It doesn't happen that often, but it's allowed. And if a proton is going to do that, there are some rules it has to follow. The first rule is that the electric charge of the proton can't just vanish. It has to stick around. Protons have positive charge. Neutrons have none. So that positive charge gets carried off by this thing called a positron. A positron is the antimatter counterpart of an electron. Antimatter is basically matter's evil twin. So anytime antimatter and regular matter, the good, virtuous, normal matter, whenever they meet, they instantly hate each other, and the matter and the antimatter spontaneously turn all of their mass into energy. So that positron that we see coming out that's basically one way of carrying energy out of this process. So there's some energy carried by that positron, there's some energy that just comes out in gamma rays, and then finally, we also have this other byproduct called a neutrino. And this is the important piece of this whole process. So this neutrino that comes out in this first stage, that's gonna come back later. So remember, one neutrino at the first step in the process. That's the hard part. Once that happens, it's more or less smooth sailing in the sun. So we take that two hydrogen nucleus with one proton, one neutron. We smash another proton into it. We get two protons, one neutron, and we end up with three helium and also some energy coming out. And then that three helium that we just made in the previous step will meet another three helium that was made in a parallel chain of events, those will smash together, they'll create four helium, but there are gonna be some extra protons around. Those three helium nuclei together carry a total of four protons, but we only need two of them to make helium. So the extra two whiz off and eventually they'll bump into something else and make more helium through another instance of the proton-proton chain. We get a bunch of energy out at this stage, and this is the end of the process. So essentially what's happened? 
That whole stage of events that I walked you through produces one helium atom from a total of four hydrogen atoms. Two from that first chain, and then two from that duplicate chain that I ignored implicitly. So we've got two pairs of those first two steps, and they converge at the final step to give us our output. So what that means is that we're going to end up with two neutrinos coming out of this process as well. Those neutrinos are going to be important because they lead to an important puzzle in 20th century solar physics.